it's great to, to have this conversation with you, Dan. And, and um, for those who are going to, to watch this, my name's Julia Slingo, and I was for eight years until I retired over four years ago now, um, the chief scientist of the Met Office. I thought actually, Dan, I'd, I'd just start by giving a little bit of a historical perspective as I'm um, an old scientist now. And uh, you know, climate change is not really that new, is it? I mean, uh, we can go back to Arrhenius in, in 1896, who already worked out that actually if you put carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, it's going to, the world is going to warm. And, he wrote actually, and it's very interesting to see what he said. He said, the enormous combustion of coal by our industrial establishments suffices to increase the percentage of carbon dioxide in the air to a perceptible degree. So he'd already worked out that it was us and our actions. And he then went on to say that any doubling of the percentage of carbon dioxide in the air would raise the temperature of the Earth's surface by four degrees. Celsius. Now, you know, that's really interesting because that's well within the range that we think a doubling of, of carbon dioxide would give us. So what's taken us so long here? And then actually, if we skip right the way forward now, nearly 100 years to 1990, and there's Margaret Thatcher, who was actually quite a visionary on this and a real political lead on the whole business of climate change. And she said then 30 years ago, we will be taking a great risk with future generations if having received this early warning, we did nothing about it or just took the attitude, well, it will see me out. The problems do not lie in the future. They are here and now, and it is our children and grandchildren who are already growing up who will be affected. So very profound words from, from her. I'm seeing it from an old scientist point of view, um, and I'm now handing, you know, I've done my bit, I'm handing the baton over to you, Dan, but it would be great to hear your perspectives of that story. You know, I call myself a climate scientist, but I didn't know some of what you said in there, so it's great to, great to hear that. Just to sort of back up a little bit and just introduce myself, I'm Dan Mitchell and I'm a, a climate scientist based at the University of Bristol. And uh, I, like Julia, sort of build and run climate models. And I look at the impacts of those, those climate models on, on human systems and, and societal systems. I guess when I was at school, the climate change issue was not really that prominent in the media. But of course, the big environmental issue when I was young was the ozone hole. And that was, that was very clear. And you know, that's an example of an environmental problem that we identified uh, and we put solutions into place really fast and we've seen an amazing slowdown and now recovery of the ozone hole and yes it's a much more simple problem I'd argue than the climate change problem and yes there were readily available solutions there but it is sort of disappointing to see you know we can do it and we show we can do it but we're not doing it so so much with climate change. Yeah, I think that I think that's right. Of course, I mean the ozone hole, as you rightly say, um, was much a, a simpler problem to fix, and it didn't have the societal implications that climate change does. And I think it's the fact that it is going to affect everybody's daily lives is a thing that makes it so so difficult. And the economic implications of um, fixing the problem if you want to put it as simply as that, are just immense, which is why politicians have never really ever been able to sort of step up and take the long view, isn't it? Because, you know, the sort of policies that you'd probably have to put in place would make the electorate think you've gone nuts. <laughs> and, and yet, you know, we so we've left it for 30 years. And it's amazing, isn't it, when you think that, you know, it took us to 20... 2015 and the Paris Agreement for enough countries to sign up and say actually we really have to do something about this. So it's a, been a, a long long journey hasn't it to reach this point and then you have to ask well why, why emergency now why wasn't it an emergency in 1990?
yeah, exactly. And I, I guess that sort of um, takes us nicely into what do we actually mean by a climate emergency? Uh, and the reason the climate emergency is a climate emergency is just because of how long things like carbon dioxide stay in the atmosphere. And, and that number is, you know, a large proportion of today's CO2 emissions will stay in for hundreds, if not thousands of years. In fact, some of that CO2 will even stay in for sort of up to 10,000 years. And you sort of think back into history, you know, what was going on 10,000 years ago? That was woolly mammoths and saber-toothed tigers. <laughs> These timescales are huge. And as, as humans, we don't think on those timescales. And as politicians, we definitely don't think on those timescales. And, and that's why it is an emergency. Every day that we have in it, in action, we, we ensure that our, our planet has that day's worth of CO2 for hundreds and thousands of years. And that, that's the real problem. I think that's right. And I think, you know, when we think about, well, it, it's such a big problem, what can I do about it? Well, of course, as you rightly say, if, if every day you put slightly less carbon into the atmosphere by deciding to turn your heating down or not to drive or whatever, um, that's that little wedge of carbon that doesn't have to stay there for all that time and continue to cause damage. I think it's getting across that it's the accumulation, it's your total um, amount of carbon in your life, in, in, in my life, that I've put into the atmosphere, that, that is, is what I can do something about. But, you know, I mean, going back to this word emergency, which suggests that, you know, the planet is now, I think, as somebody said to me recently, on life support, in a sense of, rather than 30 years ago, just coming into A&E looking a bit sick. Um, it's now on life support. Um, so, you know, what are we going to do? do and what, do, what defines this emergency? And what respect is, an, is it an, um, in, an emergency? And I think the perspectives on that have changed enormously, even since the Paris Agreement, actually, in the last five years. I don't know what you think. I think they do they have as well and you know one of the real problems with climate change and the impacts of climate change is that it's not immediately obvious even to the scientists that climate change played any role in the, those impacts because of course we have weather anyway we have natural events we have extreme events we'd have those without climate change we just feel that a lot of them have been altered significantly by climate change and getting that sort of way of thinking across to the public, certainly post Paris Agreement, has become a lot simpler to do, I'd say. But the numbers of the damages we, we talk about are, are huge. And I still don't think the public understand, you, you know, the 2003 European heat wave, that was 50,000 people died in that heat wave. We believe that around half of those people probably wouldn't have died without that increased temperature from climate change. Yeah. And, and so those numbers are huge, but when these things happen, you know, when someone dies, they don't write on the, on, on the, the death certificate died of climate change, you know. No, no, no. <laughs> um, and so it takes years, if not longer, to figure out what those impacts are. And they might be a crop failure, they might be sea level rise and some sort of loss to coastal uh, ecosystems and things like that. Really hard to point down, really hard to get that across that yes, these things do sometimes happen naturally, but they can be impacted by, by changing climate as well. You know, you, I suppose the, the, the person on the street would say, well, why is it an emergency? You know, you think of COVID as being an emergency and, and it certainly is. And, but the difference with COVID is we know how to get ourselves out of this tight spot. You know, we will find vaccines that protect most of us most of the time. And, you know, we will rebuild our economy and our society in fairly short order and so you know people tend to think of well it's emergency why 
what you're talking about, you're talking about 100 years, 1,000 years, what's so special about this particular moment? And I think, you know, you've already sort of touched on it in saying that the longer we wait, the worse it gets. But it's that, how do we make a compelling case for urgent action? Uh, what's different now other than, you know, the dialogue, I suppose, is the science telling us anything new? Why it's such an imperative that we deal with it? I guess it's interesting. And, you know, we talk about the, the vaccine being the solution to COVID. And, you know, we, we have developed the vaccine for the climate emergency and it's called renewable energy. <laughs> and it, it, <laughs> it's how we apply that in a cost effective and an efficient way. And there are other technologies out there you know there's carbon capture and storage which, which will be very important but it's not the solution you know you're not going to extract all of the carbon out of the atmosphere that you know it might get us 10 percent down if we're lucky or something but it's implementing these technologies um things like electric cars and electric infrastructure you know will be amazing once it's in place as long as as long as things like electric cars are getting their energy from renewable resources why, why now is much harder to answer and half of me feels it's just because the younger generation in particular are just pushing it as such a strong agenda, you know, high up their list. The politicians really have no choice but to listen now. I, I guess at the start of your career, Julia, you, you know, you, this was all very well known about and so why do you think that there was not so much action there? I, well, I, I think, of course, we didn't have really the compelling evidence of how damaging it could be. Of course, you know, the models that we used to, to predict the uh, effects of climate change were pretty basic, actually, when you look at what we've got today. I wouldn't say we saw it as a sort of academic problem, but actually it was sort of, well, you know, yeah, it's a bit... CO2 levels are going up and they're going up a bit but you know when you get to the point where you're um, they've gone up 30 40 percent above what is normal at least for the last 800,000 years you begin to think mm. but I think actually what we're seeing now is real evidence of impacts on extreme events and that well, that's when it begins to hurt doesn't it I mean whoever you are it begins to hurt um, I mean I I think you know your COVID analogy is actually quite quite pertinent in the sense that I think you're absolutely right the vaccine is renewable energy um, but just as we have with COVID we found other treatments to make its effects less severe so you know you, you know you're right that actually there are things like carbon capture and storage which will help a bit there's also things about uh, you know energy proofing your home for example so that also will make a quite a big difference actually if our homes were much more energy efficient and there's things like our own personal behavior and I mean COVID is a very really good example of how we've managed the impacts of COVID by changing quite radically our social behavior and so I think there's sort of analogies there that there's not one fix uh, of course you know the ultimate fix is not burning fossil fuels it's quite simple but beyond that, there's all sorts of other things that we as individuals can do and governments and businesses can do. And I think it is an emergency because we cannot go into a world that's three or four degrees warmer than, than pre-industrial. I mean, we're one and a bit degrees warmer now and actually it's not good. I was looking back at something, an old friend of mine who was an astronaut actually, Piers Sellers, and he wrote, um, before he died, new technologies have a way of bettering our lives in ways we cannot anticipate. There is no convincing demonstrated reason to believe that our evolving future will be worse than our present, assuming careful management of the challenges and risks. History is replete with examples of us humans getting out of tight spots. The winners tended to be realistic, pragmatic and flexible. The losers were often in denial of the threat. And I think, you know, that that's the message in a way, isn't it? Yeah, we've got an emergency and actually we're pretty smart. And, you know, we will find ways out of this. But of course we won't unless we have a strong foundation in science. And I wondered what, you know, 
let's get back to some science because we're both scientists. I wondered what you thought were the, for you as a, a, a generation after me as a scientist, what you think are the really big advances in science that we need? I strongly believe that climate science took off significantly um, when we really started to develop these complex models. And that was your generation, Julia, who did that. You, know, you created the, the amazing models. The, where the increases do come is with the resolution of those models. And that's the spatial resolution I'm talking about mainly. And that's because the science has moved on. We, we, we're not interested in if humans are causing climate change anymore. We, we know they are. We're interested in how are they doing it and what are those impacts. This, this is where there's a little bit of confusion, I think, because we always talk about these global mean temperatures of one degree or two degrees. And I always ask my students, I say, if you had two pots of water that was three degrees different from each other, could you really tell the difference if you put your hands in, especially if you waited an hour between the two? And the answer, of course, is no, you, you'd have no idea. You could also ask people, was the weather yesterday cooler or warmer? And they wouldn't be able to get it within five degrees often. <laughs> um, and of course, for the scientists, that, that's actually quite obvious because one degree over such a large area of a planet's surface is huge. And we know that that affects things in very non-linear ways at a much more local scale. And that's why I think the resolution of models has to increase. But there's a problem there is we are getting to the limit of our computation power. You know, the, you can't just keep adding on more processes because they don't scale so well. They, those processes have to communicate with each other and it gets a little less efficient. So the problem is we are topping out to, at that level. And, you know, there are advancements, things like quantum computing. You know, I don't know how realistic that is in the next couple of decades, but those sort of increases in, in computational power, I think are just essential because we need to get our models to the, to the kilometre scale resolution. So we can look at the local crop impacts, health impacts, all those things, you know, over cities rather than at the moment where our models, you know, at best are a sort of hundred kilometre grid box, um, which, which tells us a hell of a lot, but it's, it's not the questions we're asking now. So. That's where I'd say the science needs to go in the future. And it's not, depressingly for me, it's not just a science question, it's a sort of technical question as well now. I think because our climate is already changing, we've got to start adaptation now. And that means, you know, we have to have the information, not maybe out to 2100, but certainly for the next two or three decades. And I think the other, the other message here is that, you know, as we start that adaptation, we have to remember that the pathway to net zero is not clearly defined, actually. There are many things that could derail us from that pathway to net zero, such as we don't really know what will happen to our carbon budgets and things like that because of what natural systems will do. So we have to think about, I call it adaptive adaptation, but we can't wait. We really do have to get on with that. Otherwise the economic impacts of even today's weather and climate will be really profound. You like, uh, I really like that term adaptive adaptation actually, Julia. I I'm not sure I've heard that before, but um, I, it makes perfect sense actually, of course. And again, let's focus, focusing on the UK, then one of our major problems is we're, we're just such an old country. You know, we built our infrastructure over millennia and they're not, they're not what I call climate efficient cities in the slightest. Whereas if you go over to America or, you know, or UAE or country or, or places like that, their roads are in grids and the air flows much more nicely and, and the drainage of flooding is much better. But, you know, if the centre of London flooded from the Thames, we would lose all of our infrastructure. Um, <laughs> you know, it would be devastating. We'd lose our government, our, our security services, our economy. And so... The question of what adaptation we do to prevent that, it might be 
there might be a low chance, but the impact is so great that, that we say the risk is very high. So there's questions that we have to make on, on how high do we build the Thames barrier, which is the barrier, of course, that defends the centre of, of London from uh, flooding. And it's not an easy question to answer because, of course, something like every metre you build on top of that barrier costs X billion pounds to do. So, yes, we'd love to build it 10 metres higher, but that's just not, not feasible. And so your, your question about adaptation is, it, you know, I answer it as a scientist, but I understand why a politician or a town planner might answer it differently. And it's exactly as you say, it's what's the risk of that that impact occurring. And if we get it wrong, it can be really bad. And, and an example is, of course, again, going back to flooding, if we build up river defences on either side of a, a river and we get it wrong and they're too low, when that river does flood, it floods in a worse way than it would have otherwise because you get, a, you get the breaking of those banks and therefore you get a mass of water rather than the trickling. And so, there's a really big responsibility on us to, to get these adaptation measures right. The possibilities of uh, what we could be looking at are st still hugely uncertain, actually. And um, so I think, you know, there's masses still for climate science to do. Getting now down towards the complexity and the local nature of what is now needed is so much more difficult. I did want to just get your opinion on Dan because I mean one of the things that always struck me when I was certainly uh, at Reading University and then at the Met Office is how difficult it is to I used to call it bridging the valley of death between our sort of fundamental science and it, then its application into societally relevant quantities or metrics or whatever until we do that actually our ability to do adaptation or find good solutions or to understand the risks are, are not going to be very good, actually. So what, what do you think are the challenges there? Well, it, it's a really good question. I, and again, I, I don't think people quite appreciate how many moving parts there are in the Earth system before you even get to the societal system. And I think you and I are a great example of that because, you know, from the outside, we're both climate scientists and you'd think right we're exactly on the same page but actually you're a you're a tropical climate scientist and I'm an extra tropical climate scientist and, and actually I suspect if we um you know if we worked together we would you know it would there would be some challenges in understanding both the two systems and 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 that's already really closely related so you take the next step and you say okay well let's go outside of climate science and let's think about um, societal systems or economic systems and suddenly you're just you're talking a different language um, you know so those things are difficult. I think that is I mean I think the next generation you know not you not me the next one the young people coming in today that's what they really do want to work on these sort of um, uh, multifaceted complex problems don't they because they do see now the global implications of of all these emergencies, if you like, and how they are all coming together. It, it, to come back to, you know, the climate emergency problem, um, I always go back to my old friend, Sir John Beddington, who was the chair of the Cabot board uh, before me, actually. And I worked with him when he was government chief scientist. And, and it, he really talks about um, uh, the perfect storm and I think this is this is the real message of why this is an emergency today, because he says, can nine billion people, which is where we're heading, be fed equitably, healthily and sustainably? Can we cope with the future demands on water? Can we provide enough energy to supply the growing population coming out of poverty? Can we do all this? whilst mitigating and adapting to climate change. So, you know, even without climate change, 
we have an emergency. You add climate change into it and, and we are in a very, very uh, challenging place and there is no time.